In this video, we will introduce the direct delta function. This is the overview slide, which we'll spend about five minutes on, and then we'll go over each topic in more detail and with more examples. The Dirac delta function on its own isn't very useful, but in an integral and with different examples that we will show, they allow you to solve problems that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. So Paul Dirac developed this function which was zero everywhere except at a single point where it was discontinuous and behaved like an infinitely high, infinitely narrow spike of unit area. We will develop this kind of odd definition, infinitely high, infinitely narrow spike of unit area in our next video. But one thing to say is that there are functions that describe these discontinuous and uh, functions where all the derivatives diverge. These types of functions are often called singular functions. We will motivate our first example by looking at an ideal impulse. So in mechanics, we often consider some mass, an m naught, and we apply a force to it, changing its momentum in the direction of the applied force. So we'll look at a regular kind of application of a force, and we will use this to consider the idea of an impulse where uh, the force and the momentum change instantaneously. We will use this idea of an ideal impulse to motivate the definition of the Dirac delta. So the Dirac delta, we're going to start by centering it at t equals zero, and we're going to say uh, our force, or our Dirac delta, is equal to zero everywhere except at this one point, t equals zero. So it's zero, um, it's actually equal to one at t equals zero, and zero otherwise. So zero everywhere. Now focusing at this t equals zero, we say that this one particular point has an infinitely high spike. We said it was infinitely high, infinitely narrow. So generally, we would say the area under the curve, well, we want to define that as equal to one for our Dirac delta. It's simply a definition. And generally, our area is width. In this case, we said it was infinitely narrow, so our width is zero. And our height, well, it's infinitely high, so our height is infinity, so our zero times infinity equals one, which is a strange thing to say, but we'll kind of approach this um, in our next video to kind of justify this kind of strange definition here. But for now, we're going to say that if we center our interval around this t equals zero at some point, you know, t uh, to the left, that's the minus, and then t to the right around this, this uh, t equals zero point, then we're going to get one because we're going to center around here, so we're going to include the spike. If we don't include the spike, it's going to be zero otherwise. And then we write the ideal impulse in terms of the direct delta. We look at other singular functions, point mass and point charges here. And then finally, we're also going to skip a little bit of head because this is in a future section of our chapter. Actually, it's probably in our next video. Sometimes the direct delta is called the sifting integral. It's nice here because your book has introduced it in terms of an application. When you look at this on its own, the direct delta without this integral, it doesn't mean much. So with the integral, what you'll see is that what happens is the integral of the direct delta, centered now not necessarily at t equals zero, but at t naught, times the function f of t, what you'll get is the direct delta will sift out the evaluation of your function at t naught. And we'll do some uh, examples of this. So that concludes our introduction. We'll come back over here and we'll start by motivating this ideal impulse. We'll start with our definition. So this is the abstract kind of mathematical definition. It doesn't have a lot of usefulness until you use it in integrals, but this is the definition here. So uh, Paul Dirac required a function which was zero everywhere except at a single point. So we think of this function at zero, and then all of a sudden at this one point it has something different. But aside from this one point here, it's the function zero. And at that single point where it was discontinuous and behaves like an infinitely high, so now our function goes infinitely high, infinite, infinitely narrow spike of unit area. So it's kind of a curious definition, but this is um, the def how we define the direct delta function.
In physical situations, it's nice, and we usually describe using equations and operations on continuous functions. Sometimes, however, it's useful to consider discontinuous, discontinuous idealizations, so kind of some simplifications or we, in the ideal situation where we could have a mass density of a point mass or the force of an infinitely fast mechanical impulse. And the functions that describe these are extremely discontinuous. That is, they and all their derivatives must diverge. And for this reason, they are often called singular functions. And the examples of singular functions which we will be looking at are the ideal impulse, point mass, and point charges. We are going to start with the ideal impulse. In mechanics, an impulse is a force which acts on an object over a finite period of time. So we're going to consider this realistic force here. So it is zero, the force is zero, until we hit this point somewhere around t equals t1, when our force increases smoothly from zero to its peak value, and then it finally returns back to zero at t equals somewhere around t equals uh, t2. When we apply this force to an object of mass m0, the momentum in the direction of the applied force changes. The momentum, then graphed over here, remains constant until we hit t1, when it begins to change continuously until it finally reaches its peak value, and then um, at t equals t2. The net momentum change is equal to the integrated area of the force curve. So this point, this shaded area here, is equal to the change in momentum over here depicted by the change from here, the, the initial value, to its peak value. And we can integrate from negative infinity to infinity dt f of t. In this case, it's 0 until we get to t1, t2, dt f of t. So then we're going to have t1 to t2 dt m0 dv dt, which is equal to the change in m0 of v. Now we're going to compare this force, this kind of realistic looking force and change in momentum, to an ideal impulse, which produces all of its momentum changes instantaneously at the single point t naught. The force of an ideal impulse cannot be graphed as a function of time in the normal sense. The force exists only for a single instant, so it's zero everywhere, except at t equals t naught, where it's it is infinite, and we just kind of designate the infinity by putting an arrow and an infinity sign on the top. But this is not just any infinity. Since the total momentum change must change in m naught v, the force must diverge so that any integral which includes the point t naught gives the momentum change, and any integral which excludes t naught must give no momentum change. And we write this here. As long as we're between t minus and t plus, if it includes t naught, right? So if t naught uh, is in between t minus and t plus, then it's going to include the change of momentum. Otherwise, it'll be zero. And this is what motivates our direct delta function now. So instead of force, we're going to say the direct delta. If we include, in this case, direct delta, Initially, we're going to have it centered at t equals 0. So if we go from t minus and t plus, and that includes the point 0, we include then the area equals 1. So our integral will integrate to 1. If we don't include the point 0, you know, if, if we're integrating from over here to over here, then we're going to miss this one spike and our integral should be zero. Likewise, if we're over here to the left, if our integral is to the left of the t equals zero, our integral will not include the spike and will equal to zero. And then, again, this by itself, the direct delta, is not that interesting, but when we write it in this integral, it becomes more interesting, and then it becomes useful when we put other things with it. So the ideal impulse written in terms of the direct delta then is going to be between t minus and t plus dt, direct delta t minus t naught. So now we've just shifted our direct delta from zero to t naught, right? We know this from shifting functions from algebra. So it's equal to one as long as t naught is in our interval and zero otherwise. Again, here I have t minus t naught just translates the spike of the direct delta uh, function so that it occurs at t naught instead of zero.
and then our ideal impulse for with our force is going to equal to uh, our delta m naught v direct delta t minus t naught, and it's going to be equal to one m naught v if we include t naught and zero otherwise. Before we go to point masses and point charges, because these involve uh, a three-dimensional direct delta, I want to talk about the sifting integral, which is actually from our next video or the next section of our chapter. But I think this is a good time to do some examples with the sifting integral, so I'm going to introduce it here. And the idea is here's our direct delta function um, centered at t naught now, so instead of centered at the origin. If our integral includes our t naught, then our direct delta becomes 1, and we're left with f of t naught. If our integral does not include d t naught, then our direct delta becomes 0, and our whole integral becomes 0. So in this way, our direct delta is sometimes called the sifting integral because it selects or it sifts out our single value f of t naught. Our first example of the sifting integral idea is the integral from 0 to 3 dt of our function, f of t is going to be 2t squared plus 5, and then our direct delta is going to be centered at t naught equals 2. And if we think of this function multiplied by our direct delta, as long as our lower limit and our upper limit on our interval encloses 2, our t naught, then it's going to be, our direct delta is going to equal to 1, and this function that we're integrating is going to be 2t squared plus 5. If this uh, t naught equals 2 is not in the interval, this direct delta is going to be 0, so this whole function, when we multiply it by 0, is still 0, and the whole integral will become 0. Well, since our t naught is 2, and our interval is 0 to 3, 2 is in our interval, so our interval is going to be uh, 2t squared plus 5 multiplied by 1. And now, if we think of integrating, looking at our area, that's where we get our 1. Remember, as we approach um, 2 from the left-hand side, our direct delta is going to be 0 right until we hit 2. So this function evaluated at any t that's uh, to the left of 2 or smaller than 2 is going to be 0. Only when we hit 2 is this direct delta going to become 1. So that's the t equals 2 is the only um, number that's going to contribute to our area. So that's why we plug in t equals 2 is 2 times 2 squared plus 5. And also, once we pass the 2, again, our direct delta then is going to go to 0. So none of these larger things between um, larger than 2 up to 3, they're not going to contribute anything to our area. So our area is solely contributed by t equals 2. We plug that into our function, and we get 2 times t is 2 squared plus 5, which is equal to 13. Our next example is the integral from 0 to 1 dt. It's the same function, 2t squared plus 5, and the same direct delta centered at t naught equals 2. The thing about this here is we're going to look at this, again, our 2t squared plus 5, and our uh, t to the left, t to the right of 2. Well, our interval our, of integration now is from 0 to 1, and 2 is not in this interval which means we're in this otherwise case, so our direct delta is always zero throughout the whole interval, in this interval anyway. So we have zero times our function, which is zero, so when we integrate over this interval, we get zero. So again, this is critical that your t naught is inside your interval. And just one more example, the integral from negative pi to pi dx sine of x our direct delta x minus pi over 2. So you can see our t naught is pi over 2, which is in the um, interval from negative pi to pi. So we're just going to plug in directly our integral then. It's going to be sine of pi over 2, which is equal to 1. Here we are on our overview slide. We've ident we talked about the ideal impulse, and we use that 
to motivate the definition of the direct delta, and then we wrote the ideal impulse in terms of the direct delta. So next we'll look at point masses and point charge. A point mass and a point charge. So a point mass has a finite amount of mass stuffed inside a single point and space, and charge is the same except instead of mass, it's charge. So the density must be infinite at that point and zero everywhere else. So integrating the mass density over the volume gives the total mass enclosed. So this is this uh, definition here. When we integrate our mass density over our volume, then we will get the total mass inside V. If there's a single point mass M not located at the origin, any volume integral which includes the origin must give the total mass M0. Integrals which do not include the origin or exclude the origin must give zero. So that's kind of expressed here. We have this, our integral to find our total mass, which is integrating our mass density over the volume. So it's going to equal to our total mass M0 if we include the origin, assuming that the mass is located at the origin. I should underline that because later we'll change that, but yes, or relax that um, for a point mass, M0 at the origin, and it's equal to zero if the origin is excluded from our volume. So now hopefully you can see the um, similarity with the direct delta. So here is our direct delta function. So to write the point mass in terms of the direct delta, this is our density is equal to M0 times our direct delta in the x, y, and z direction, because now we're in three um, dimensions. So our volume integral of our mass density is equal to dx, dy, dz, m0, uh, our direct delta in the x, y, and z. And then, um, and if the point mass is not at the origin, but at x0, y0, z0, then our mass function is, our, our mass density is equal to m0, the direct delta at x minus x naught, direct delta y minus y naught, direct delta z minus z naught. In this video, we introduced the direct delta function. We looked at the formal definition, which says that this direct delta is zero everywhere except at a single point, where it's discontinuous and behaves like an infinitely high, infinitely narrow spike of unit area here. We motivated this by looking at mechanics and an ideal impulse. We had a force that um, gradually ramps up at T1, it starts to increase, it peaks, and then it comes back down to zero at T2, and then it would change the momentum of an object with a, a mass M0. And what we did is we compared that to an ideal impulse where the force and the momentum occur instantaneously at a point, a single point, T0. And we said we wanted the entire change in momentum then to occur at this one point. And we used that to motivate a direct delta function that is zero everywhere except at the single point. And we started uh, by centering the direct delta at zero. So at zero, we had this spike. It was an impulse, infinitely high, infinitely narrow, and area is equal to one. And how we get this unusual definition of area equals one when we have an infinitely narrow and infinitely high uh, object, we'll talk, discuss in the next video. So the ideal impulse then, over here from mechanics, can be written in terms of our direct delta. So we can center our impulse at T0. We can move it from zero by subtracting T0 from our direct delta, and we get our F of T is equal to our change in momentum times our direct delta centered at T0. We did, um, well actually before we did the other example point mass and point charge, we said that this um, integral here with the direct delta centered at T0 is often called a sifting integral because it picks out the value of f of t naught, the single value out of f of t. And then we looked at point mass and point charges, which had this three-dimensional direct delta, which is essentially just direct delta in the x, direct delta in the y, and direct delta in the z directions. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.